about an answered uh, magnetic conversion. And if you sh can share your screen, we can start. Okay, is now that shared? Yes, perfectly. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to make this presentation. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about a detector that a number of us have been working on for some years. Uh, the Lee Baker HFGW detector was first proposed, uh, I'm going to say about uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, and um, a, a small number of us have been thinking about how to um, uh, focus its design in, in, in the last uh, number of uh, several years. Um, so I have to acknowledge uh, all my colleagues who've been working on this. Uh, first and foremost, Dr. Baker and Dr. Lee, uh, and it's unfortunate that neither of those were able to make this presentation. Uh, and I shall do my best to present it as, uh, to start with at least uh, as they would have presented it themselves. Uh, but a number of others have also contributed to the development of the uh, proposed design of high frequency gravitational wave detector. So I'm acknowledging them there. Uh, and here's an outline of my presentation. Uh, we've heard a lot about the inverse Gertzenstein effect. I'm not going to spend much time on that, but just to remind you of it, uh, to summarize the Lee effect, uh, I'm not going to spend much time on relic HFGWs. Again, uh, you've heard a lot about that. Uh, I'll be talking about the detector configuration, uh, a, a report that appeared about 10 years ago on that detector, uh, uh, and uh, a little bit about the Lee effect in more detail, some design parameters, and then m no, uh, the, the issues with the Lee Baker detector is really a progress report, and it's my personal uh, view on where we've got and what I think are the next things that we need to think about. And then I'll finish with some conclusions. So uh, you've heard about the Gertzenstein effect. I'm thankful to Dr. Tamarit, who summarized it very nicely earlier. Uh, so uh, you all know the paper by Gertzenstein, a classic paper, 1962. Uh, static B field plus an electromagnetic wave produces a gravitational wave. I'll illustrate that uh, at the top. Uh, EM wave uh, with a magnetic field produces a gravitational wave in line. And then the inverse Gertzenstein effect was also mentioned in that paper. Uh, it's interesting that he said this problem is hardly of interest. And it turns out that we're very interested in it. Uh, anyway, uh, the what, what he's proposing there, of course, is that you start with a gravitational wave and in the presence of a magnetic field that produces uh, an electromagnetic wave. Uh, and it's very easy to do some order of magnitude estimates. Um, it's very insensitive as a potential HFGW detector uh, and it's ha hardly noticeable on if you put in cosmological parameters for the various um, variables in the equation. So uh, that brings me to the Lee effect, which is uh, rather different. Um, so in the Lee effect, uh, it starts out looking like the inverse Gertzenstein effect. You establish a basic static magnetic B field, uh, and then you add a microwave beam. And in the uh, versions that we've been thinking about, we've typically thought about beams on the order of a few gigahertz, but uh, uh, of course you could think about terahertz, you could even think about light waves as well. Uh, and that couples with an incident high frequency gravitational wave of the same frequency, direction, and wavelength. And Lee calls this the synchro-resonant condition. Uh, it's not really a resonance in the way that uh, I would understand that in the circuitry context. Uh, there's no um, Q effect enhancing the amplitude. 
Um, but what it means is that it should be phase coherent. The two, two waves, the gravitational wave and the electromagnetic wave should be phase coherent over uh, the um, length uh, over which you're considering the interaction. So if you're looking at a cos cosmological scale with enormous distances, that means that you've got to have exactly the same uh, wavelength of gravitational wave and electromagnetic wave. Of course, that uh, means that in a vacuum, they're going to have exactly the same frequency as well. If you're thinking about lab scale, that condition's rather relaxed. Um, all, all that you really need, of course, is that the electromagnetic wave that you put on uh, will couple phase coherently with a gravitational wave over the interaction length that you're interested in. So therefore, uh, the two don't have to have exactly the same k and omega. Uh, it just depends on the relationship between the wavelength and the interaction length. Uh, and then Lee predicts that if you have that, then it produces what is called the perturbative photon flux or PPF. And it's perpendicular to both B and K. So I've illustrated that in the diagram at the top. Um, you, you get a PPF in the perpendicular direction. And that's the um, summary um, that of the Lee effect that really encapsulates what Lee is saying. Uh, and uh, you've seen this sort of diagram before. I'm not going to spend very much time on this. This basically says that uh, if you're looking for relic high frequency gravitational waves, um, then quite a good frequency to look at is in the gigahertz range where um, the Electromagnetics is fairly well established and things like waveguides and amplifiers and, and uh, so on are uh, very old technology and well understood. So we can handle the electromagnetics quite easily. Uh, and also there's uh, a peak in the relic uh, high frequency gravitational wave spectrum. So we think we're on to looking at something that we might be able to detect there. So we have an opportunity there. So can we make this work? Well, this is the uh, a diagram of the basic configuration that's been suggested. Uh, and this comes from work, as you can see, about a dozen years or so ago. So let's just go through this for the record. Uh, we start with a high frequency gravitational wave signal. Now, of course, it's immersed in a bath of high frequency gravitational waves in all random directions and all frequencies. Um, but the, the, the one that is going to be picked out by this detector is the one that is phase coherent with the Gaussian beam, the, the applied uh, electromagnetic beam that I'm going to talk about next. Um, so um, I've, I've just drawn there the one that is going to be detected by the detector. But I didn't bother drawing all the other random directions and random frequencies and wavelengths that, that are also present in the system. So uh, whoops. Uh, next is the uh, electromagnetic beam, which is always called a Gaussian beam, as we'll see later. Um, the direction of that in the diagram isn't shown, but that is assumed to be propagating from bottom to top as well, so that it is phase coherent with the incident HFGW signal. Uh, and um, it's, it doesn't have to be exactly the same K and frequency as long as it's phase coherent over that interaction length that, we've, that we're thinking about. Uh, then we have a magnetic field, uh, that's B in the diagram. Uh, so I've just indicated that schematically with a north and a south pole. Um, and then that produces the electromagnetic signal as photons that propagate sideways uh, uh, in, in the direction that's indicated there. 
And then to detect those, we have some microwave receivers each side, uh, one each side, since there's uh, two lots of propagation directions. What else do we have? Well, you're probably going to have to house it in some sort of chamber or containment vessel. Uh, it may need to be cryogenic to reduce thermal noise. Um, so that's just indicated schematically there uh, as a containment vessel. Uh, and, and that has other um, effects on, on the system as well, as we'll see later. Uh, and also some sort of means for focusing the PPF or gathering it or concentrating it. And people have proposed various ways over the years for doing that. Um, what one illustrated there is two reflectors that are hopefully outside of the Gaussian beam. So they're, they're not illuminated directly by that electromagnetic beam. Uh, and the idea of that is to reflect the PPF to a direction uh, away from the Gaussian beam so that the microwave receivers are not being illuminated by the Gaussian beam that you're applying to this. So that's the basic configuration. Um, now, about 10 years or so ago, um, a report appeared from an organization called Jason that has uh, uh, achieved quite a lot of publicity, um, which uh, th there, there is the report and, and basically said, this can't work. Uh, here's one quotation directly from that report. Um, one such proposal introduced an additional EMW naught, that's the Gaussian beam, with the same frequency as a GW and the very weak EMW it generates in passing through the strong B naught regions. So the weak EMW they're referring to is the uh, photons from the inverse Gertzenstein effect. This is well understood homodyning of the weak signal. Uh, and, it, and it goes on to say, well, that's just the same as superimposing a uh, an electromagnetic beam on the Gertz, on the inverse Gertzenstein effect. So we know that the inverse Gertzenstein effect is very insensitive. So this isn't going to work. So there, there's a picture of what Jason is talking about. Uh, we start with an HFGW and it produces the inverse Gertzenstein photons in the same direction. Well, of, of course that's wrong um, because the Lee effect is not a superposition of an electromagnetic wave homodyne onto the inverse Gertzenstein effect. Uh, if that were the case, then the it detected photons from the Lee Baker detector would have the same wave number uh, wave vector as the additional electromagnetic wave, and and of course that's not the case. Uh, Lee predicts that the PPF is perpendicular to both B and K. So uh, that argument is not going to fly. And uh, if you've seen the JSON report, you will know that the standard of diagrams and the, in places the language is also a concern. Unfortunately, that report achieved a lot of publicity uh, and uh, it put back the development of the detector quite a bit. Uh, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Uh, I'm not going to go through the mathematics uh, in, in vast detail. Don't get worried by this. Uh, but those are the perturbed electromagnetic fields. Uh, and in the notation that I'm using here, if, if it's got a dotted underline, that means it's oscillatory. Uh, and if it's got a solid underline, that means it's a constant value. So what's going on there is the, the uh, perturbed electro electromagnetic fields uh, are proportional to the applied field, the constant applied field. And also uh, the magnitude is proportional to the interaction length. That's the length of whatever it is you're using uh, perhaps the length of the 
applied magnetic field, the extent over which the magnetic field exists. And of course, it's also both fields are proportional to the high frequency gravitational wave amplitude. So um, because each field amplitude is proportional to H, then that means that the photon flux is proportional to E cross H, or that's proportional to H squared in the Z direction. And that, of course, is just the inverse Gertzenstein effect. So what Lee does is then add on to all that a Gaussian electromagnetic beam. Uh, and again, don't get worried by this. I'm not going into all the details of this. Um, all I'm going to point out here is that uh, the psi there is not a quantum mechanical wave function. It's just a shorthand for saying this is either the E or the H field. Uh, and uh, R is the radius from the vertical axis. So this is the radius from the uh, axis along which the beam is propagating. And that's the same axis along which the gravitational wave of interest is propagating. Uh, and so you can calculate the photon flux density in the x direction perpendicular to the vertical direction, the direction of the electromagnetic wave. Um, and uh, the superscript one in parentheses means perturbed value. And Lee is calculating that uh, as proportional to the pointing vector uh, and it's time average the angle brackets mean time averaged. So you end up with this horrible looking expression. But again, I'm not going into the details of this, just to point out that the photon flux density in the x direction is proportional to all the things that you would expect. It's proportional to the interaction length, delta L. It's proportional to the intensity of the applied field, the constant field, by. Uh, it's also proportional to the intensity of the applied electromagnetic field, hz. Uh, and it's also proportional to the uh, GW, gravitational wave amplitude, h. So therefore, it's a first order effect as opposed to the inverse Gertzenstein effect which is a second order effect. Uh, the photons produced in the inverse Gertzenstein effect are, uh, flux is proportional to H squared. Uh, the photon flux density predicted by Lee is proportional to H. And that I think is the big advantage that Lee and Baker are claiming here because H of course, as everybody knows is so small. So if we can find a way of converting this in first order, then we're on to a winner. And then we can calculate the number of PPF photons per time. This is, this is gravitational wave converted into electromagnetic photons signal. Uh, so the number of the total number of PPF photons per unit time received is the integration of the photon flux over the receiving area, which I've written there. Uh, and I'm just going to simplify that and say that it's equal to the flux multiplied by the effective area of whatever microwave receiver you're using. In practice, that might be the area of the concentrators or the reflectors or however you're going to set up receiving the uh, perpendicular photon flux. Uh, you've also got to think about the number of noise photons that you receive. Uh, and uh, it's been pointed out earlier today that, uh, of, of course, if you try to receive the inverse Gertzenstein photons axially in the, the z direction, that's hopeless. Um, you, you've got to look perpendicular to receive the uh, signal photon flux. Um, but you've also got to think about what other photons you're going to receive in the perpendicular direction. And that was the point of using uh, an electromagnetic beam of limited, um, uh, of, of limited extent, because <clears throat> if it's a perfect Gaussian beam, you can actually calculate what the photons traveling perpendicular to that are. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but 
uh, you can do those calculations and work out the perpendicular photon flux purely due to the Gaussian beam itself, which is always going to be there, uh, even if there's no gravitational wave. And then again, multiply by the effective receiver area to get the total number of photons per unit time that you're going to receive in the perpendicular direction. And then a little bit of statistics over a collection time delta t, uh, you know that you're going to get that number of noise photons, just multiply the number uh, per unit time by the collection time. Uh, and then you know that those number of photons will have that standard deviation. So uh, if you're going to collect that number of PPF photons, that's again the um, Lee effect uh, perturbative photon flux in the perpendicular direction multiplied by the receiver area, multiplied by the collection time, um, then the condition for observing the results of the gravitational wave are that the standard deviation of the noise is going to be less than the signal that you collect. Uh, or, and you can <clears throat> turn that around and show very easily uh, that you've got to make the observation over that minimum time. So we can calculate a minimum observation time for this. I will interrupt you, five minutes left. Thank you, okay. So uh, people have played around with typical design parameters uh, and we, we've heard today um, uh, suggestions for design parameters for this sort of detector. Uh, and the, the values I've shown there are order of magnitude of what you could probably achieve with today's technology. Um, I've suggested a frequency 2.9 gigahertz. Um, everybody knows a microwave oven works at 2.45 gigahertz. Uh, six meter chamber length, well, that would be dwarfed by the sort of facility that we've been hearing about earlier today. Magnetic field three Tesla, uh, maybe you could improve that. It doesn't need to be a particularly uniform field um, of, of course, in this case, just as long as it's of that order of magnitude. Uh, you, uh, you, you can uh, argue about what sort of amplitude you want to receive, but I've put in a suggested amplitude of 10 to the minus 27 at 2.9 gigahertz, typical of a relic gravitational wave. You can put in the numbers and you get that number of photons per second, um, work out the number of photons per second from the Gaussian beam. Um, that gives you an observation time on the order of 10 hours or more, which is clearly feasible. Uh, so this is looking good. Um, what's not so good is that if you want to detect a relic detection, and this is a point that Mike Cruz made earlier, um, you, you're trying to detect a random signal um, and so that's got to be uh, less than um, uh, so the, the spurious photon flux has got to be less than what you're trying to detect. If you're trying to detect a terrestrial high frequency gravitational wave, that's not, uh, that condition isn't required because you can turn on and off a terrestrial source, however you make it. Um, so you know when that's going on and off. So it's, it's not a random signal, but if you're trying to detect a relic gravitational wave signal, then uh, you, you need that the spurious photon flux is going to be less than what you're trying to measure. Uh, and you can do the sums there. That means that you need less than one in 10 to the 19 photons will spill over in the wrong direction. Uh, that's quite a daunting requirement. Uh, that includes diffraction from the microwave optics and containment walls. This is sort of typical picture of what people draw uh, with absorb microwave absorbing pyramids uh, in here. Um, and we've got to minimize the 
reflections from the container. We've also got to minimize its spurious diffraction from whatever uh, collection device we're using. I'll come back to the transmitter in a, in a minute. Um, this is the sort of thing that, that is a worry here. Supposing you have some sort of reflector to reflect the signal to somewhere where the Gaussian beam has a much smaller amplitude, uh, well, okay, it will do that, but you've also got to work out what spurious diffraction there is from that. And I'm not going to go through all the details of those calculations. That's all standard diffraction theory. Um, typically, you find on the order of 10 to the minus six or so, 10 to the minus seven photons goes in the wrong direction. Uh, and remember, the condition was we needed 10 to the minus 19 uh, to, or, or less than that to go in the wrong direction. So that's a problem. So uh, what are the issues with this proposal? Uh, I have a problem with using the pointing vector to calculate the per perpendicular photon flux. Um, there are theoretical reasons why pointing vector doesn't always give you the right answer. Uh, so I have a problem with that. Um, strictly speaking, this should be a longitudinal mode electromagnetic beam, not a TEM mode, which is what most transmitters produce. Uh, so, uh, and nobody's really thought about how that's going to happen. Uh, maybe it would happen with a waveguide or cavity mode. Um, and then that starts to look sort of like the some of the detectors that other people have been talking about here. And that's good, actually, because what it means is that a number of people are converging on the same sort of geometry from a number of different directions and will be converging on the optimal way to do this. How can we reduce the spillover from the transmitter? We're currently many orders of magnitude away from thinking we can do that. How can we minimize the spurious reflection diff and diffraction from the applied EM beam? Uh, I wonder whether we can detect the electric field or even the magnetic field directly without going through photons. Of course, it is possible to detect electric fields um, directly. And that would also be a first order process. So if we could think of a way of doing that, then that would also be an improvement on the inverse Gertzenstein effect. So finally, Conclusions, I have questions over the Lee effect. Um, spillover breakthrough diffraction, that's a major problem needs to be thought about. I'm not saying those problems are insoluble. It would be brave to say that, and I'm not saying that. Uh, I do know that a con an embedded conventional reflector, which some people have proposed, that's not going to work. But external reflectors to redirect the PPF may work um, when we need efficient absorption of stray photons somehow. Uh, and it may be less demanding to detect terrestrial HFGWs than it is to detect relic high frequency gravitational waves. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I think we have time for a few short question, please. First, uh, Andres, please go ahead. So thank you very much for the nice talk and that you also brought up some, some questions which are good to think about. So one thing is, uh, so what, would, it, would it help is if you just, so what would you learn if you just switch off the magnetic field or the, so, so uh, for some time and you measure without and with magnetic field. So at least then, uh, you get some uh, some idea about the noise floor, isn't it? Yeah, that 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 has also been proposed, and I think in practice you would do that because you want you want to be able to do synchronous detection in order to because in minimize Alps your did, noise. Yes, in Alps we did yeah, this. Sure. So, so it, yeah. and of course we had we yeah. had as many data with magnetic field on as without, okay. and then of course one could also change the change the uh, polarization of the of this Gaussian beam, I guess. I don't know what what, what it, maybe it doesn't help at all, but uh, maybe yeah. <laughs> if yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, I, 
we need to think more about the polarization because it needs to have, it needs to be a longitudinal mode for the mathematics to work yes. out. Is that that's my understanding, uh, uh, and I, and I think uh, um, amplitude modulation is going to be a, a, a very important experimental technique to use in this to minimize the noise. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I think next is Francesco, please go ahead. Yes, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, a very quick question. Has this um, concept uh, ever been tested with uh, like prototypes or things like that? No, no, th this is all paper design at the moment. We, we have not <clears throat> been able to get to the stage where we could um, make, make a, a, a serious attempt at an experimental construction. That doesn't mean we haven't tried, but we've not achieved that. Okay, thanks. Maybe the next is Andrew, please go ahead. Yes, hi, very interesting talk. So I just had a question about the transverse nature of the photon flux. So mm -hmm. are there any issues there as far as energy momentum conservation in terms of what's breaking the symmetry there, which is allowing you to send photons off in these other, in the other directions? Um. I'm not sure that I'm qualified to answer that question, but I will say that you get photons going in both directions. I, I, I'm not sure if that's getting at what you mean. Is it completely isotropic in the transverse uh, plane? No, no, because it has to be perpendicular to the uh, applied constant magnetic field. But what's setting the preferred direction in terms of just being along your axis where you're looking? Um, yeah, I, I, I need to think a little bit more about what you're asking there. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, if, if you're asking me, do you have to get all this perfectly aligned exactly? Um, I, I don't think that's the case. Um, no, I'm just wondering physically what's breaking the symmetry. Why is it that photons are going in that direction? In, in one case, you have a magnetic field that's signaling yeah. some direction in space, right? Yes. So now, yeah. I think you get a flux, a flux which goes, which goes, uh, so to say, either both both electromagnetic waves or photons go out from from the from from the from, hmm. from in, that, and, that is and, symmetric, and, like, and then they go. It goes symmetric. They go out and they go in. So, so you, you could. At this and 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 it depends on the position where you are, whether they where they go out or go in. So it's a, it's a bit. I mean, it's, it's hard to. I think one should uh, make a a picture of that. But, but, but uh, sorry, isn't the point that there's still a constant magnetic field that is breaking isotropy? Yeah, of course. It's, yeah, of course right. the isotropy is broken, of course. Right, yeah. but the but the photon flux is perpendicular to that magnetic field, not along the magnetic field, unless I'm misunderstanding. Yeah, I think Andy is asking about isotropy in the plane perpendicular to the constant V. And in that plane, you should technically have photons in all directions. That's my it goes, question. It goes in all directions, cylindrically, mm -hmm. so to say, but they go, either they go out or in. I uh, I'd need to look at the mathematics, but I don't think so, because the symmetry is being broken by the polarization of the perturbed um, electric and magnetic fields um, along the, 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 the lead to the formation of the inverse Gertzenstein photons in the Z direction. Yeah, so where do they get their polarization from? That is, that is from, indeed the question, right? That's from the applied constant magnetic field. Well, so if the applied constant field is in Z, they can have any polarization in the XY plane. No, no, the applied constant field is in the y direction. Rem but the, the Gaussian beam is breaking the symmetry on the on the XZ plane. to go back to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you still have to conserve energy momentum, right? In, in, yeah. in, in, with the transverse photons. So I think that if you go three slides forward, and I think we that, that was just here, the top right, no back? Back. Oh yeah, this this also works. This also works, right? This this yeah. this figure that you have here on the on the right, right? This this little sketch. Yeah, yeah. So here, right now, I think Andrew's question, which was also kind of what I wanted to ask, is like, how how do you get out of the plane, right? Like, what breaks momentum here? So from your answer, I guess you go here 
you need to kind of have actually two photons, right? One going in the direction of the red arrow and maybe one going in the opposite direction. Yes, in order yeah, to yes, 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 there is. Which, and I didn't bother drawing the one in the uh, ne negative x direction. Right, right. So that then I think would solve the, the momentum conservation question, but then it's really a, yeah, it's like really a two photon. Like if I think of it as, as kind of a Feynman diagram or something, right? It's really a two mm. photon. Yeah, uh, I, mean, final state. I mean, the, the symmetry is in, indicated in the main diagram there. If I go through to there, um, we, we do expect that there should be PPFs coming off in both directions. But only those directions, not in a, not in a complete azimuthal plane. Uh, I, I think, oh, okay, I, I, I think probably what would happen is that the, uh, you, you would get a figure eight uh, azimuthal diagram in the xy plane, so that you would get zero uh, in the direction of the applied field, but then a, a figure eight diagram like, uh, uh, um, like a ribbon microphone, uh, and uh, of course the the direct the, the maximum is in the x direction but if you go 45 degrees midway between x and y then the amplitude would would fall off and there would also be nothing um at Sorry. 45 degrees between x and z uh x and z uh that that's even more complicated to calculate, I, I don't know what would happen. But I think in, in some papers of Lee and so on, you, 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 he has shown sort of polar diagrams or something yeah, like, like that, yeah, where yeah. how the how how this uh, how where the maximum flux is and so on. So how this. Mm -hmm. So there there are some. I remember such ellipses and and uh, polar diagrams. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you have a reference, I'd be interested to see the. the yes. Thanks. I, hey. I will have a look, yeah. Valerie, do you have another question? Uh, sorry, no, that was answered, thanks. Okay, Nancy? Yeah, so I have a, a few questions. I think we already talked about the polarization. So that was not clear. So where you showed the psi, that is just the magnitude of the field. But um, I think, yeah, you didn't talk about what polarization was assumed for the um, um, RF field. Um, sorry, I couldn't hear what you said then. Are you talking about the polarization of the imposed electromagnetic field? Yeah, what, so when you were calculating the photons um, that you call N sub X, yes. what is the polarization that you assumed to calculate that? That, that, is, that assumes a longitudinal po polarization of the electromagnetic beam. And I don't think any of us has uh, have really thought about how that would be produced in practice. And I, and I think it probably would end up needing a some sort of waveguide configuration or a resonant cavity configuration. Uh, and I don't think having a, a no, an ordinary transmitter at the bottom would do it. But no, nobody's really thought about that very okay, much so far. And then can you can you actually go to the slide that calculates the photon um, flux in sub X? Tell me when to stop. Yeah, yeah, that right there. So yeah. I think uh, between the slide between the slides before and between this one, there was a step mix uh, missed and, and that's where I'm getting confused. So there is this cross term that you're um, specifying between the applied Gaussian beam and the generated photons mm -hmm. from the Gerstenstein effect. But shouldn't there also be a cross term from the two E and B of the applied field itself? So, so, so as to say the zeroth order cross terms, those will also have photons. Um, and I guess that depends sorry. on the polarization that's picked. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not clear which uh, field you're talking about here. So like here you have um, E1 and B0, but you will also have terms that are both zero at order. Mm -hmm. um, and, and where do those go? 
a zeroth order be much larger right than this one well that 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 corresponds to propagation in just in the z direction in the z direction Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, it, it and, and and the whole the point is we're not look we're yeah. not looking in the z direction. Okay, maybe it's, it's yeah. better to stop here, and uh, you can explain better and fill the details in the discussion session. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I think the session ends here, and now we have the coffee break. Yeah, many thanks to Giancarlo for sharing this session and we reconvene uh, in uh, 10 minutes, say at 10 past.